Uh, from there, uh, the University of Arizona uh, for three years. Um, after spending four at Northern Illinois, uh, I went to Stanford for a year, Utah, University of Utah uh, for two uh, with Coach Cal Whittingham, who's still there at this, this point. Um, and then I went to Iowa State and worked with uh, Gene Chizik uh, there, uh, uh, partly because I knew he had ties to the University of Texas. And I thought that would be uh, in my best interest to uh, get on with a guy that was the quote unquote hot name at the time. And from there, we bounced to Auburn. He took me with him. I was the only coach that he brought with him. I was his special teams coordinator. Um, uh, he brought me there to Auburn with him. Um, uh, won a national title there. Uh, went on to Oklahoma, uh, the school that I'll refer to in the rest of this meeting as the school north of the Red River. Um, uh, went there, been there for seven years. and. Um, uh, like I said, I was really blessed to get a call from uh, from uh, Coach Herman and the staff uh, asking me to come back home. And uh, that, that brought me here to this point, it brought me here in front of you guys. Uh, I absolutely love it here. I love the guys that I work with and girls, Miss Tori. Um, uh, I just think this is a, a wonderful place with a lot of great personalities and a lot of great people that uh, I, I really enjoyed getting to know the last couple of months. Can everybody hear me okay? I don't want to yell. Um, all you got to do is throw the, uh, and put that thumb down, Coach Peterson. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's, it's horns up or thumb down, all right? You know what I mean? We still don't like those, 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 those people that, um, out in that cow pasture out there in the middle of the state. So even though we don't play anymore, they're still our rivals, all right? Uh, what I want to do is, uh, again, um, I, like I said, I'm going to jump right into it here. Um, kind of got give you guys just a, a, a brief – introduction here and I got to minimize some things guys so just give me a second here you know all this, this technology stuff that we got going on here you're good coach but we're, right now we just see the special forces with this yeah I'm talking about my screen but because <laughs> you can't see your stuff I got all I got these you. people sitting up here right in the middle of my screen and um so uh I, I'm trying to get get rid of that so just give me a second as I minimize that a little bit for me uh all right, boom, okay. So, uh, Ms. Tori, if you guys can let me know about, it, about anybody in the chat and whatnot, uh, any questions, just chime right in, interrupt, uh, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, if you guys have questions, shoot them, shoot them out, and we'll try to get through as much of this as I possibly can uh, so that we can, we can um, have a productive meeting here, okay? Um, first and foremost, uh, I believe this, and as a special teams coordinator, uh, I've been doing this for, um, Gosh, since 2002, so 18 years, I've been a special teams coordinator at different institutions. And I believe this, this quote, uh, leadership, like coaching, is fighting for the hearts and souls of men and getting them to believe in you. Uh, Eddie Robinson obviously won a lot of football games uh, in his career. I believe he's third on the all-time winning, winning list uh, at, this, you know, um, uh, at this point. I don't know who's passing them or you know, if anybody's passed them since then. But my point being is, uh, I think when you're coaching special teams, I think you really have to get those those guys to believe in you, and you got to get them. You got to, and, and the only way you can do that is if you fight for them. You know, uh, another, another quote that he he talks about is just, you know, you can't coach a kid in, in, until you love them, right? You got to love them first, and once they know know that you love them, and I'm not verbatim obviously with the quote, but once they know that they that, that you love them, they'll, they'll do anything for you. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that on special teams. Uh, not that I'm going around trying to be friends with, with, with all the guys, but I do believe that they have to respect you and they have to understand that you're going to give it their, your very best and they'll give you their very best. I, I think that's important uh, as a special teams coordinator because all these guys would rather be on offense or defense, uh, not we fence, as I call it. Okay? Another quote that I, I live by on special teams, uh, I think the secret of winning football games is working more as a team, less as individuals. I play not my 11 best, but my best 11. And that really goes on all three sides of the football, but uh, I think it's important um, even more so on the special teams play because you get one shot, man. It's just one play. It's not, it's not you know, you got three downs to get a first down or a touchdown. It's, it's or, or stop somebody from getting a first down or a touchdown. It's one play. And uh, you got to have those guys uh, in sync and playing as a group of uh, a group together. 
uh, guys that just, you know, just kind of jail. So that's kind of what I look for. I look for some unity uh, in that area. Um, special teams for me, uh, I, you know, we're all thieves. Uh, I stole this from one of our offensive coordinators uh, along my, my way. Uh, he talked about E4. And ever since I've heard this, I've kind of carried this along. I'm not sure when I, I implemented it in special teams, but I implemented it uh, at least for the last you know, 10 or 12 years, man. It's been a big part of what I believe in. Uh, I believe E4 uh, on special teams. I believe that this is the difference in a lot of football teams from average to good, from good to great, you know, from great to national top champions. Uh, I believe every single play, we need to play with energy, okay? We got we, we to energize the crowd. We got to play with the edge and we got to execute, okay? So energy, energize, edge, and execute. That's a big part about what, what I believe in. And I think a picture is probably worth more than a thousand more than a thousand grease board reps here. So let me show you guys a few examples of kind of what I'm talking about when I say E4, all right? Our guys understand that, okay? Uh, uh, pretty big ball game, uh, not in the sense that, I'm talking on teams, not in the sense that, you know, golly, you know, you know this is Auburn, they're playing Kentucky, uh, but that's Randall Cobb back there returning punts. Right. So you as a special team coordinator knows, hey, man, they got an electric player back there, man. Every single time we punt the ball, it's a big play. It's a big play. And we got to sit his butt down. It's a big play. And we got to sit his butt down. I don't know if Randall Cobb's still in the league, but but they fire up to it. You're in the national title game. Right. And 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 you playing against the number one punt return team in the country. All right. They had six punt returns for a touchdown. Every single one of these plays is a big play. All right, watch this kid here. This is a defensive lineman that didn't even play defense for us, but he played on special teams, right? And like I said a second ago, every single one of these plays is a big play when you're facing the number one punt return team in the country for, for all the marbles. You know, there's no excuse. You can't say, oh, they're really good and they got us on one. Bull crap, bull crap. Go make a play. Watch big number 74, you know, shoot a shot. Boom, make a big play in a natty game, all right? Every so often, all right, we're still talking E4. Energy, energize, play with the edge, and execute. We're playing Alabama. They won the national title that year. They're at our house. Coach said, man, you know, we've been doing a really good job with this onside kick. You know, when we go up by seven, we're going to run it. Well, it's the first – we went up by seven in the first after the first series, and here we go. All the guys knew it. Everybody understands what's going on. Energy, energize, play with the edge, and execute. It's real simple. It's real simple. Boom. Ball, balls off, right? You can make a big-time play, all right? You know, some of these plays go unnoticed by the average person. But, but on special teams, our kids, your kids, have got to understand the impact. Opening kickoff of a game. Make a play. Set the tone right off the bat. I wish I could say that we got this ball, but we didn't. But we set the darn tone for a butt whooping that day. All right. We set in this game here, and, 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 you know, the quarterback at the time at the University of Arkansas was a guy by the name of Mallet. All right. I, I don't know if he's still in the league or not, but he was talking a bunch of noise. Right. Every play in this game was a big play. You'll see him pop up on this E4 tape over and over and over again. Set the tone. Start it off right. They have to understand what you're coming with from the start to finish. Kickoff coverage is the first play of defense, right? All right, so you're setting the tone. Every single time you run down the field, a tackle inside the 20-yard line is a big play on kickoff coverage. Huge play. Here's another example of E4, all right, after a penalty, right? We had a defensive tackle by the name of Nick Fairley that used to get personal foul penalties left and right. Right, so we're kicking off from the 15 yard line. We got you, we got you. Big play, energy, energize, play with the edge and execute. Let's not give them 20, 30 yard return. Let's stop them inside the 30. All right, stop them inside the 30. That's a big play. All right, that's a big play. Kickoff coverage again, first play of defense. We knew that they played a lot of trickery and did a bunch of different things in a national title game. The guys know it. Big play. All right, 
A stop inside the 20-yard line is a big play. Let's switch gears. Let's go back. Let's switch gears, all right? The score here is, and if I can freeze it perfectly, I'm going to try to do it for everybody, all right? The score here is 23 to 16, okay? Tennessee storming back. It's 419 to go on the fourth quarter. They just scored to pull within a touchdown, all right? E4, ST is up and ready to go. E4, we need a big play. Yes, we can get the ball offensively and run our four-minute offense and probably maybe run the clock out. But let's, 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 put this, let's, let's, let's put the dagger in them right now on special teams, right? Let's get a big return, all right? Put the offense in a scoring position or score ourselves, all right? These are huge plays that, again, you're not going to read about this play in the paper, right? But everyone knows that they're sitting in, the, in this meeting right now that the kickoff return team just gave the offense the ball on th the plus 39-yard line with a little, little over four minutes left to go in the fourth quarter. E4, E4, all right? Again, starting off, all right? Late in the game, all right? Or early, late, in the, late in the first half, right? They just scored again, all right? On the road in a big, big game. Ole Miss just scored uh, to go down by seven late in the second quarter, all right? Pretty much most people thinking oh, this probably was what's going to be the score going into halftime, okay? All right, again, E4. E4, understand the impact that your special teams can play on your football team. Instead of going in the half up by seven, let's go in up by 14 and let's blow these boys out and let's go, let's go home, all right? The whole third quarter was a party, all right? You score a couple more touchdowns, and then all of a sudden, all right, they're, they're out of it. I hate this one. I love it, but I hate it. It's actually Texas up by three, just used most of the first – first quarter to drive right down Oklahoma's throat and score just like they did the, the, the year before and beat OU in the Cotton Bowl, all right? But again, E4, E4, right? I, I get that. You're down, you're down three nothing. They just ran the ball right down your throats, all right? But special teams can be the great equalizer in a game, all right? Can be the huge equalizer in the game. You, know, you don't understand how much a play on special teams. Yeah, that touchdown is huge, all right? But you end up, you kick a field goal and do a couple other things, and next thing you know, you win a game against your rival by three, by three. Huge play, all right? Another underlying story here, 24-17, just right before halftime again. They just went up, all right? Got, you know, the whole crowd is rocking right now, rocking, all right? Again, E4, E4, I mean, I, I get it. I, I, you know, you can sit there and say, well, yeah, of course, if you score a touchdown, that's big play. But your kids have got to understand the moment and the impact they can have on the ball game, and that's what that's what E4 is all about. That you you have to teach them that each one of these plays, all right, can be a huge play for them. Okay, never look back again the rest of that game. All right, went on to take the lead and end up beating them by two or three touchdowns. Same thing here. All right, R losing losing this game three to nothing. All right, late, late, or middle of the first quarter. Set, start the scoring off on special teams to set the offense up for a score or score yourself. But start it off again. E four. Who knows if OU would have won this game or not? You know, had this play not happened, who knows how this game would have gone? But it's momentum swings. E four in the game that sets your team up. Losing to Kansas. Can't tell you how many times I've almost lost to Kansas in my years in the Big Twelve. All right, down 13 to six. All right, start it off. Energy, energize, play with an edge and execute. Lock a kick, E4. All right, again, teaching your kids these moments to step up. All right, same thing here. All right, same, same exact game. Arkansas, quarterback talking all that noise. Set up another score, block a kick, E4. Everyone knows that if you block a kick, the chances of winning that game go way up. All right. We had to score a drop in the game against Virginia, and as you can see, it's late in the first quarter again, all right? They're up 7 nothing. They've just been physically pounding us down the field, all right? Again, special teams can start things off and give your team some momentum. This is one of two block punts as well as a, a kick return uh, down to the 5, 6, 7-yard line to set this team up, and next thing you know, the game is a three-touchdown difference, okay? Losing to Iowa State at home. Losing to Iowa State at home. All right. And, and, and all of a sudden, 
right? Late, and this is late in the half too, right? It's 129, late in the second half again, set, set, set your team up, set them up for a score. That's, that's the whole purpose of this, all right? Is setting your team up for a score. I'm gonna rem rewind this back so you guys can at least see it. Again, all right, you just, you don't know the, the impact that that can have. This could easily have been a game that you lose, all right, uh, if you don't make these plays. But, but the kids have got to understand that it's not just offense and defense. You can win games by controlling the momentum or sparking your football team, all right, like you need to in the winning, winning football games. Probably one of my favorite series of plays, a punt, a punt, right, and I should have put it on here, a punt put us down inside the five-yard line. Defense played great three and out right? Three and out. You talk about complimentary football, all right? Every, all three phases are going to get a chance to get, get active in this, in this scenario, right? So, boom, again, E4, E4. Coming, coming out, we understood they, they, they were going to go on a tight punt. They, they, they kicked it short into the wind. We knew it was coming. Great call by the return man to pull the gunners off a little bit, all right? And then here we go. Again, E4, the impact that that has on your football team that you can't measure it. All right. And it go, and it's just over and over and over and over and over again. All right. Scored 14 points. All right. Uh, I want to, maybe it was 13, a touchdown and two field goals, no two touchdowns and a field goal. Cause we ran a fake field goal. I mean, we also had a fake, uh, a, a punt return for a touchdown. That was the bulk of our scoring in this game. All right. One against your rivals, Right on their on their field again. E four, okay. E four. So that's an important point. I think that we all have to understand that that's something that you know you have to find ways to motivate your guys and get them to believe in what you're trying to get accomplished. And and, and for us here at the University of Texas, we want to create energy. We want to energize our football team and our fans. We want to play with a freaking edge. Play with a freaking edge. All right. And then we want to execute. That's E4. All right. Switching gears here, going into the, to, you know, just on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, I think it's important uh, to have some kind of install uh, schedule set up, um, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, uh, spring football. Like this is an example of a spring football install. Now, I don't have all the crap in here, but I'm just showing you that, hey, we, you have it detailed out, man. You got you to gotta detail out what you're covering in your meeting. You got to detail out what you're covering in, in practice, you know, who's doing what, where, and this, that, and the other. And all you guys understand that. Y'all know that. But I think it's important to have an install schedule for your special teams, okay? Uh, I also think it's very important to have a specialist period. Um, you know, I, I've been at different places, and they've allowed different things to go on. But, but during that period, uh, you know, you, you, got, you got, you know, your, your snappers and your, and your holders, uh, your punters your kickers, I mean, your return men, all those guys are getting work and it needs to be organized. It needs to be organized to where the field, the field is, 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 is uh, spread out where guys can get the work in without having to worry about stepping on top of each other and so forth and so on. Okay, so I think, I think specialist period is important. And if your coach, your head coach gives you time during specialist period and, and it's before everything else, you might even be able to still a little, you know, walk through time with some of the other guys during this time while, while snap hole kick is going on. Uh, I think that's important. I think it's important to train your punt returners. I don't think you just tell them to go out there and just catch the ball. All right. I think you got to train them and I got, I'll get into that as we get into some of our video here later. Okay. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions about any of that so far about what we did? Um, did I just pop right back out, out of that? Anybody have any questions? Uh, I think there was one question, Coach Bulwer, but I think you might get to it. It says, will you show and or explain your kick return, punt return, kickoff, punt block scheme? Schemes? Well, yeah. they, no. I'll, I'll show you the drills. Yeah, there you go. I'll install everything. I won't get into – I'll say I'll tell you about the fundamentals and technique, which is the most important. Everybody should know schemes, right? I mean, there's only so many ways you can double team a guy, kick a guy out, and so forth and so on. But I'll give you the meat and potatoes, which yep. I believe – I believe is the um, is the fundamental stuff. And that's that's what we're going to get into next. How yeah. many coaches on our staff are involved with special teams? Like, how many help you out? Um, you know, you know, for for us and what I've done everywhere I've ever been is is assign coaches to to um, 
to coach positions, okay? And the guys that I stay away from, right? And let's, 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 let's steer this direction. I'm not using the offensive coordinator slash quarterbacks coach, right? I'm not using a defensive coordinator, right? I'm not using our D-line coach, all right? And I'm not using our O-line coach. So the other guys that, that are, not, are not that are, are my core group of guys that we work with, if that helps, okay? So all the other guys are fair game, man. And we just, you know, again, we got 10 assistants, right? Include, so so that's, that's a little bit different maybe than what you have in high school, but, but, uh, but, but everybody else is fair game, man. And we use everyone else on our special teams. Good questions. Anyone else? All right. um, there's one more. What is your philosophy on using starters on special teams at the high I, school level? I believe this that uh, and can you guys see my screen? No, I got to share. Not it. yet. You got to reshare, yes, sir. Um, I believe this. I believe that you can't overuse any one player. Okay, I believe that nobody, sh no one, if you are using a kid. No one should, should start on any more than two special teams, okay, unless he not, he's not a starter. I should say no starter should start on more than two special teams, right? And there's some guys that you just, you know, uh, you know, that might be too valuable, you know, like your middle linebacker, you know, it's like the quarterback of your defense. You know, you, you, you might use them on punt, but you're not going to use that. Use him on two, right? You know, and you might not even use him on punt. So, you know, yes, yeah, starters are on special teams. I think that's very important. Because when you get to when you play in the big boys, they're going to have their best players on special teams. And if you think of it that way as well, every great return man is a stud. And you don't want to put second teamers and third teamers up against that stud all the time trying to cover kicks on on whoever's best return man. I mean, that's just a that's a recipe for disaster, I think. You know, just like I just showed you that clip of 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 uh, Randall Cobb. I mean, I was in the SEC one year and they had Patrick Peterson and they had Randall Cobb. They had I mean, it's just honey badger. I mean, it just list goes on and on and on. Arenas. I mean, and, and you can sit there and, and, and try to put out, take all your starters off of that if you want. And then those guys will take it to the house on you right now. All right. So uh, um, rather than get into actual, you know, hey, what do you, what are you doing punt wise in terms of, you know, how, what are your, you know, what is, what is your actual scheme? I'm not going to get into that, obviously. Right. I got people that, 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 that are looking at this, that, you know, that, that, that want, to know what we're doing, right? But I'm going to tell you how I break it down. I'm going to tell you how I coach it, meaning this is what we're doing, okay? So the first thing I start off with, it's just like everything else, is we're teaching progression to everything, right? And, and the first thing I start off with is what I, a drill I call a huddle break drill, right? And in that drill, we're going to teach alignment and, a, and, uh, and uh, stance, right? Alignment and stances. So, you know, we're working on everybody getting in the right alignment, everybody getting in the right stance uh, for all our different uh, punt formations, right? And, I, and that's the first thing we do, all right? Just like on offense, for example, I'm an offensive coach. The first thing I start off teaching is what? Stance, stance, right? So, so if, if you're not teaching stance, right, then, then you're missing the boat because, because inaccuracies in steps come out of people being in bad stances okay so that's the first drill that we do and then and then you guys again you got to excuse me I don't have that much Texas film <laughs> to show you guys I got a mixture of Auburn and and uh, obviously Oklahoma uh, having not had spring ball uh, and then the next drill I get into is 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 a drill I call uh, indie drill okay and, it, and when we're running indie drill you, you have you have you know over here is, is where I put the front line on the right of the screen, okay? Uh, in, in the north, north of your screen, the top of your screen is where I put the, the, the big guys. Uh, and, and then at the bottom, I put the gunners uh, down there. And I break this up into three different groups for a reason. And I'm gonna show you some videos of some of this stuff when it's not, uh, you know, obviously scheme, scheme uh, uh, specific, but, uh, but, but my, my point is, my point is, you know, you can get all your work in this drill. I turn the front line to the side because the hash marks will give them their, their splits, whatever your splits are, yard, two yards, three yards, whatever it is for your front line, those tick marks by the hashes will let, your, let, will let that group line up there, all right? I turn the, 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 the big guys, shield, the shield, uh, 
on the north side of the field there uh, so they can get their alignment depth. Again, they're still working on alignment while, they're, while we're coaching them on assignments as well, too. And then the gunners, the gunners just have, you know, an end zone to work, and they can work all kind of different stuff, uh, different releases and, diff you know, against different techniques and so forth and so on, as well as sky pump mechanics. And, you know, so you can spend two days, uh, the, the entire special teams period on punt, just getting this whole thing oiled up and ready to go. And then while we're working that, I also have the punt returners over the left of the screen working on, again, if they're not involved in punt, I still want them working on their punt returner, punt returner progression because I train those two, two units uh, independently, but I want them to get to the same point, the finish point together at the same time so that we can work and get good on good in practice. Because a lot of times your, your starting punt team is not – on your punt return team. So you can work those two units if you get them ready to go. And they're the two that you do the most, okay? All right, so we get into indie drill and we teach all the individual fundamentals of footwork and the steps and, and those mechanics and we got, we got it all, vi all video, okay? Um, another thing, the next thing that we get into is we start teaching our guys downfield escape moves, uh, tools in their tool belt uh, that they can use. So here's some of the meat and potatoes that I'm talking about. So, you know, after you're at the line of scrimmage and you're protecting, right, the very next thing you need to do is beat your man, get on top, locate the punt returner. Let me say that again. Beat your man, get on top, locate the punt returner. Now, if you, for some reason, cannot get on top of the guy and the defender, the defender is inside of you, the punt return team is inside of you, and he's even or he's slightly behind, either one of those two. All right, then you want to execute what I call a chuck, a chuck. And don't wait till the end. You want to be the first aggressor. So get rid of them once you've tried to get on top, as, as soon as you feel, you feel like you need to, and then get to the appropriate hip or whatever you're tracking and so forth and so on. All right, that's called a chuck. All right, and then the next move, all right, again, another tool in your tool belt, okay, all right, that you can use. And again, that's just real simple. That's, you know, that, 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 that was nothing. but but, but my point in terms of nothing in terms of the drill, but, but this next drill is the same thing, okay? Pull by, pull by. If the guy is on top of you, you want to pull him by. You don't, let, you don't just keep running behind him and let him eventually turn and block you. You want to get to the right position on the return man, all right? And that's what you see there, okay? All right, this next drill, and these are drills, literally, I mean, the, the progression that I'm talking about is the progression that we'll teach here, all right? Uh, the next drill is a drill I call force fit contain. I stole it from someone. Again, this is stuff that I steal from people all, all, all over the place. And, and, and what I teach, what I teach here is I want the first guy to be in what I call a force position. Okay. I want the next guy to be in what I call a fit position. I'm going to explain it here in a second. And then the third guy to be in what I call a contain position. Right. All right. Now that doesn't look like contain as we, as we normally think of contain, but, but literally, as you're sitting there, you know, I want our coverage to look like a flying arrow as we approach the return, okay? Because in that position, right, I got my first guy in, and he's tracking whatever, whatever you're teaching your guys to track, right? Uh, and, and, and he's going to force this guy. We don't want this guy to run vertical, right? We'd love for him to start running sideways, all right? He's not making yards running sideways. And if he goes sideways any direction, this guy's in position to, to make the play on either direction once, once we force him. And the guy that's forcing, he's going to take a shot too. He's going to take his first shot at whatever leverage point that you're asking, okay? So like we go near hip to near hip, all right? So we're going to take a shot. If he turns this way, we're going to take a shot on that hip, right? All right? And so that's what we're all tracking. So he's going to make a play either way. And then this guy is going to eventually turn him back inside. And then all same thing with this guy. He's coming either way. And then, again, this guy's folding over the top as well, too. So now you have a, a web of coverage, okay? And just like you have three layers of your defense, you want three layers of your coverage. You don't want everybody to be on the same plane. Like if, if this guy was right here already and this guy was right here, you know, already – then, then that's a whole nother concept that we're going to talk about here in a second that, that, that's not being obtained. I want us to play above the ball. That's an important concept. I hear guys say inside and in front of. 
All right, I, I got this from Rich Basaccia. Uh, used to be the Cowboys uh, special teams coordinator. He's with the Raiders now. He was with Gruden back in Tampa. Uh, this is when I met him. Uh, and he talked about playing above the ball. Man, what a great visual of that, okay? Because I can take this same player, for example, all right? And right now, he's in near hip, near hip relationship. But if I move this guy right here, okay, he's not in near hip to near hip relationship and he's not above the ball. The only play this guy can make is coming that way. He can't make anything coming this way because he's going to be too far behind the football, right? But in this position, he can make a play either way. That's above the football. You have to understand what inside and front of means. And I use another term called playing above the ball, okay? So that's what we're teaching the guys there. And then a drill that I do even, even during the season, it takes me about two minutes on my first day to do punt, right? It takes me about two minutes to do this drill with the entire uh, punt team, guys, and it's called the two-man cover drill. So we're, again, playing above the ball, teaching them the concept of sprint to gather, understanding, you know, how to approach a return man. How many times have you guys seen, you, you know, you get guys down the field and, you know, I know some of these guys want you to just, hey, just go make a play, go make a play, just go take a shot and all that stuff. Well, man, you could have slowed this dude down. And if you're slowing him down and you get him to hesitate, man, you got these other guys coming out of warp speed, man. They're all coming down the field and now you got help, right? Now you got help and you're not, you're not in open field just playing one guy, you know, trying to make a play, all right? If I get two guys down the field, I can cover any kick. And most kicks, you, most punts, most kickoffs, you'll have a guy, at least a guy from each side coming to, coming to the rescue there. And that's what we're teaching there is continue to close ground. You notice they all get, they all sprint to gather their closing ground. And now you're teaching the concept of, hey, when do I fold over the top? Like this kid's actually a little bit late. You fold over the top once that hip disappears. And then you want to get back on top of the top of the return man too. Again, you, so, so you can stop his vertical charge okay um, the very next thing we teach is a drill I call the midpoint drill it gives us a chance to work all those fundamentals that you that I just talked about on the punt team all right and and and, and remember that punt return team that I was talking to you about well you know what they're ready to go to now all right so 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 they've been working in tandem you know you have one period this punt and then the next period is punt return all right a special teams and now all of a sudden you got you come to a point where they're both fully equipped with tools in their tool belt, and now they're ready to get after it and compete. And, and so you're going to see it. So this is, this is coverage. This is the coverage phase. So we, you, know, you, you spend all this time training your punt team in, in how to protect, right? You got to train them in how to cover, all right? I actually call this phase for the punt return team the interference phase, okay? So it's before they get to the punt returner, but you know, not the last 10 yards, but this part here, this is where the punt return team can get active, man. They can, they can get after you pretty good here. Incidental tugs, slingshots, all right, uh, stab offs, you know, arm bars. You know, they can use all those things to try to slow you down as a punt team guy. That's why I say if you're on the punt team, you don't want to sit there and have a guy running side by side with you because he's going to keep harassing you and keep trying to slow you down. So this is a drill where all those guys can put those tools together and work it and compete and guys fire up to it, okay? So that's what they're doing here. You'll see the punt team's on the outside, all right? The punt return team, again, in that same position is on the inside, right? So both of those guys are there, all right? And, and, and now they're working with this punt returner, right? They're working with this punt returner, a middle return, a middle return. So here they go, boom. Notice the punt team takes the first shot, all right? They're gonna be the first aggressor, right? And then now they're getting in position Notice, the, notice how this kid right here immediately gets into what? Above the ball, coach. I want to get near hip the near hip relationship so I can make a play either way, not just the direction that is coming to me, okay? All right, and so that, that's the first one. And then, and then now the punt return team is going to get a little love here, all right? Again, they're competing. They're fighting their tail off, all right? Fighting their tail off. So one guy wins and one, one, guy, one guy does it. All right, again, another, another coaching point, okay? Another, another tool in the punt return team's tool belt. And we're not even talking punt return here yet, but my point is you, the, the only way you can finish on the punt return team, with, you're not blocking in the back. It's, it's what I call a box out finish, right? A box out finish at the end. Because this guy, the punt guy, is gonna eventually sprint together, all right? 
and start to slow down and give you time to catch up if you're just a little bit behind, all right? If you're right even up with them, you can widen this guy and then retrace. You can widen him, then retrace. That's another tool in his tool belt to finish. But other than that, that's it. If you come in there and you're trying to block this dude in the back, it's going to be a block in the back, all right? It's going to be a block in the back. And that's questionable. I get it, you know, but you guys get the point, okay? So, so you teach your kids all these different tools, and then you watch them work. You see who's listening. You see who's understanding the concepts that you're talking about over and over and over again, right? And so you see guys try to utilize some of those techniques that we're teaching, okay? Another way that you can test them good on good again, again, we're talking coverage now, is just a team release drill, all right? A team release drill is just, a, just that, okay? So instead of everybody going at once, all right, you got two guys going at a time. So you got the outside two guys going, then you got the two tackles going, the two guards going at a stationary punt return target, uh, punt returner, and, and now they're just competing. They're using their tools, both sides of the ball, good on good, right? And at that time, your shield can continue to get work. Your punter, he can, you can either shoot the ball with your punter down the field, or you can, if, if, if you want a consistent ball in the same place, then you can use a jugs machine. All right. So again, that's just the team release drill. So you get a shot of that again, working good on good. So your so your ones and tens get to work against your best gunners, and now you get to see really what you have. And now everybody again is starting to utilize those tools that they have on how to finish. Okay. And so that's just that drill in a nutshell, right? Um, just you know, just kind of how how we teach you know uh, the progression here at the University of Texas. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that before I go into the next phase of, of uh, teams? There's a couple. Um, the force, fit, and contain guys are who are on punt team position-wise, question mark, or do you teach those jobs to all on punt team? Teach them to all on punt team. If you guys saw the drill, right, that uh, it was it's a big old hula hoop, and I can say who I got it from. It was Bob Stoops that gave me that drill when I first got there. He said he loved it, and I kept looking at it. I'm like, that makes a little bit of sense. So you put them on a big hoop and you send them around and around and around. And then different guys end up being the force guy, the fit guy, and the contain guy. You know, it's always the third guy in. Okay. So, uh, you know, again, I still steal stuff from every, everywhere I've ever been. And I just started using that because I think it makes sense. All right. So that's a good question. Are there any everyday drills, um, any that you use more often, or do you just do it based on team needs? Um, yeah, it's pretty much based on team. Uh, in terms of um, when, you're, when you're talking about, you know, punt team, punt return, and so forth and so on. Other than the cover drill, like I said, you know, I, I'll do that weekly um, uh, with our punt team. Um, I just think that's important, teaching them how to stay above the ball. Um, the, the, the only everyday drills that you do are what's your specialist. You know, those guys are doing everyday drills, per se. Just like position coaches, I have my tight ends, they're doing everyday drills. So, so uh, I wouldn't say the punt team or the kickoff or the punt return team has everyday drills that they do. That's a good question. Um, last one is how do you identify players for certain positions, body type, speed? What are the key attributes that you look for? Yeah, it, it all depends on your scheme uh, and what you're looking for, uh, what you're asking that guy to do. Uh, you know, for us, I mean, that's a, a lengthy discussion um, that, that we're just not going to get into in depth in, in, without explaining the actual, you know, what scheme we're actually using. But, but uh, you try to find guys that fit the, the body type of whatever scheme you're asking. For example, um, you know, the guards on the punt team need to be a little bit bigger than the tackles, right? Uh, they're going to have some inside rushers that may be a little bit more physical than the guys on the, on the edge, right? Um, not to say that that's always the case, but typically as you look at most punt return teams, that's pretty much – pretty much pretty uh, typical. So that's a good question, but it just re involves uh, more, you know, scheme specific type stuff that you need to get into uh, in order to identify personnel. We good? All right, let's get to the next thing. Let's rock and roll. Cause again, I can talk about this stuff forever, man. We, we'll, we'll be sitting up here all day. Miss Tori having me say, telling, telling me to get on with it. That's all right, statement. kickoff drills. Okay. So, so again, just going through my progression, right? The, the very first thing I teach is a get off. And, and what do we learn in a get off drill? Well, obviously we're timing up the actual get off, right? I mean, that goes without saying, but you're teaching stance, you're teaching alignment. That's the first thing that you got to teach your guys before you start teaching them 
all the other stuff and, and, and how they do the other stuff. You got to teach them how to line up. And, and that's what, that's the first thing that we do. And again, you know, you see, I mean, whatever, whatever your, your, your deal is, you know, with your kicker, like, uh, for example, you know, this kicker, I, I had a certain amount of steps, you know what I mean? They, they told my guys when to start and run. Cause I don't like our guys. Once they start, I don't like them looking into the kicker and trying to time them up. I want them to turn their freaking head and run full speed. Right. By the time they hit that line, I mean, you're looking at that kid there. By the time they hit that line, man, they should be full speed. And I'd like for them to get as much of the line as they can when the ball is struck, right? I'd like for them to be within one yard. So I'm, I'm measuring this and I'm looking at, you know, who's actually leaving when I'm telling them to leave and who's leaving before. I can freeze the fr frame right now and say, okay, if I'm telling you to leave on this fifth step, who's leaving and who's not, right? And so you start pointing out different guys that aren't leaving and where they are once the ball is struck, and now you can kind of work on your get off, okay? And so you so you try to perfect that as you go, and you can't spend a whole lot of time on it. You can just bring it to their attention, and then you go on with the next thing that you're doing, okay? Uh, again, th this is a full sprint, right? I want the guys, you know, kickoff coverage. You know, you used to hear guys talk about, you know, you got your speed zone, and then you got your read avoid zone, and then you got your contact zone. Man, this is a this is a full sprint to the 25 yard line, man, as fast as you can get there. I, I, I even time our guys, man. All right. I don't even, you know, subscribe to this zone. I mean, this is just one big zone to me. You know what I mean? So however we get to the 25 yard line, all right, that's what we need to do. We need to squeeze to the football and all that. I get that, but, but, but it ain't about, you know, me identifying what the return is because at that point in time, I want our guys to play as fast as they can all the way to that 25 yard line is the flying 40, right? We all talk about it. We all say it, well, let's coach it. And that's what we do. And uh, through the years, my kickoff teams have been very good uh, uh, throughout the years, man. And, and the only time they haven't been is when my kicker, kicker's been so deck gum good that they never have to ever cover any kicks. So uh, that does happen at times too. The, the very next drill I teach is a, is a cross face drill. So the ball is kicked over on this side of the screen right, when I'm going with these guys and then vice versa. And then if you notice, you know, like somebody asked a question about body types and, and so forth and so on. Well, I already have these guys aligned in how they're going to look when they're running down the field. If you saw any of those clips of those plays that those guys were making inside the 20-yard line, you'll see levels of my, of my coverage units, okay? We work levels, okay? We have gunners. We have second-level fit players, okay? Just like we do on punt, we do on kickoff. Again. All kickoff coverage is, is an open field run fit, right? It's no different than playing defense. You have, you have three levels of your defense. You want three levels of your, of your kickoff coverage too. Because again, if everybody's on the same level, then there's no way you can be above the football. So what I'm teaching our guys allows them to squeeze to the football and, and, and then not play on the same level. So this is the first thing. Everybody on the backside of a kickoff is crossing face to the football. It's just that simple right? You don't have to make it hard. And then all of a sudden the ball's coming back. And then now you're teaching, you know, wh whatever you're teaching. Like for me, this is a force player. This is a gunner. And then these guys are again, are fit players off of, off of both of those, including that guy who's really my third level player. And you can see how that's working, right? He's the third level. So that's the next drill that we teach. And then after we teach that, we got to teach them how to punch, man, how to get physical at the point of attack. And the way I teach that is, on the freaking sled. This is a left sled, right? This is a left sled, right? So elbows in nice and tight, thumbs up, right? And then you want to create that triangle with your hat and your hands, and then you want to strike and knock this pad back. And you want to have your shoulder pads underneath these shoulder pads, man. You want to get underneath it and punch and drive your feet. If you punch and knock this mechanism back, then it lifts naturally. Don't try to lift it. It should be a mechanism that if they understand how to truly punch, they'll understand that once you knock it back, then you can very easily run through a guy or and or lift him up, all right? And so that's what they're working on here. You notice the guys are getting down immediately, right? Getting down. So you're a little DBs, man. They don't, they don't know how – they don't work any sled work. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got to teach these guys how to punch. And so that's what, that's, what, that's what we're doing here. We're teaching them how to punch. And then the, the, the part that I call of, of our kickoff coverage called two gap and drive, two gap and drive. So once we learn how to punch, then we go to a two gap and drive drill 
And again, you notice levels, levels, right? We're already learning how to work off of each other, all right? So two gap and drive for five, snap down, right? And then, and then again, now instead of the returner being on the back side, now he's on the front side, right? He's on the front side, and that's what we're working on the front side. And again, we're working our fits in different levels, okay? And, and so that's what we're doing there. Again, you're looking for the closer I get, the faster I move, run my feet, all right? And then snap that dude down, and here we go. So that's what we're working there, all right? And then, and then a drill that I love, okay, because then you start talking about the competitiveness. So you get some kickoff return guys over here, and then you get some kickoff guys over here, and then you just work two sides uh, of, of your deal. So, you know, again, while you're working kickoff, you can be working KOR, all right? So now you're identifying KOR personnel in space, and, and this drill is used to identify your internal gunners. You need guys to have loose hips, right, that can get around guys in space in or, and, stay, and still stay above the ball, right, near hip to near hip. And so you're looking for those guys. They're not easy to find. It's, it's not just the fastest guy running down the field. That's, that's a huge part of it. But the guys with the loose hips, those are the guys that play your twos and play your fours uh, in the scheme that I'm using, okay, or your gunners, okay. And then the last drill that I do in, in implementing, and, and that drill has multiple phases to it. I just didn't get into all of them, but that, you know, the teaching tackling angles and frontal and profile and all that, uh, not just the spot drill. Uh, it's multiple drills in that, in that section. But the last drill that I do, which I think is probably the biggest difference in what we do, and I think a lot of guys are starting to do it now because I've been doing it for probably, oh, since 2008 or nine. Um, it's a drill I call, um, uh, this is the cover drill, excuse me. We've already seen the cover drill. The next drill is the uh, close proximity drill. Um, I've been doing it since 2008 or nine, and it's just I put the, the return team in, their, in the positions that they're, that they're in uh, once they get to the 25 or 30-yard line, however, whatever they drop back. I already have my kickoff team on their spots, right? On, 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 I put some little dots out on the field or cones or whatever. And then on my command, on my command, we toss the ball up. I blow the whistle once the kick returner catches it, and now we're just working that open field run fit, man. Working on guys fitting on this return where they're supposed to fit and so forth and so on. Like I said, kickoff coverage is just an open field run fit. So we get, man, we'll get 18 reps in the 10-minute period of a team's return. Teams don't have 18 reps worth of returns, right? They're not going to have that. But I work two groups, and so that's nine for each group, and teams usually don't have nine returns. But if they, if they do, you get to work every single return without running your guys all the way down the field. I think that's very, very important because that gets old, right? I mean, you, you just don't want to just keep running. That, that's not the way to teach your guys. So I get heavy into this during the season, and we, we'll cover a couple uh, during the week uh, on the last day that we run it. But, but uh, the first day we do it, man, we're just, we're just lining up, man, and, and fitting it up, right? So here's a, an example of that. We're lining it up, fitting it up. The kickoff return team is where they would be uh, once they drop back, and then we just squeeze to the return from there. We learn how to fit the return up. If you watch it, you can see guys taking right angles, you know, like here, here's that cross face drill on the backside, right? And then you see right away, right, who's not doing that and who is, right? Right? That's the two over here. So he's supposed to stay outside, but his job is not to contain the freaking – uh, tackle his job is he can go in here and contain the returner. That's his job is contain that guy, right? So I can see certain things, and if they do it wrong here, they'll do it wrong in the game, because that's the same thing that they'll get once they run all the way down the field. The same exact thing. So you're trying to teach them that look and help them understand how to fit perfectly on every single return. If you're worried about, you know, man, do, do I am I am I teaching this guy enough to make that decision? He's getting enough time to actually have to make a decision in 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 mid kick you can do an extended close proximity drill as well too maybe early in camp uh, you know before you you know you get in the game week you can do an extended close proximity drill if you're not willing to run guys all the way down the field where you still you take out about 15 yards you know of running but essentially they're still run, they're running a little bit so they're now they're having to make that decision all right uh, as to which way I'm going and uh, and again still the same fit man. you're still working that fit like right away I can tell you just looking at this you know the two's not containing you know he's not in the right position in there and, and, he, and he gets exposed by by a guy that's running scout team scout team return man 
And so, so that's what you're looking for. You're looking for those different fits and uh, you're trying to see if guys are understanding what you're coaching them to do. All right. I have a number of axioms. I didn't mean to get into all these uh, cause they can get, get really lengthy, but I did want to want to cover one, which is play above the ball, play above the ball. It's not the first time you guys heard that in this, in this, in this clinic talk right now. So I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. All right. On kickoff coverage team. It's, I, I, I jokingly say it, you know, I'm kind of a, kind of a sci-fi geek a little bit, but it's like coming out of warp speed, right? So guys are running full speed down the field to the 25 yard line. So I'm freezing it right there, man. I want guys to sprint and I'll time us. I'll say, man, you know, we're at four, three, you know, my first guy hit the 25 yard line at four, three, right? Well, that's when this, that's when that clown's catching the ball, right? So we're all ready to the 25 yard line. Everything else, in front, from here on out, is extra. <laughs> if, you, if you just make a play from that point on, if, it, if the ball is coming back, it's extra field position that you wouldn't gain if you kicked, if, if you kicked the touchback. It's extra. So, boom, we're kicking, right? And so watch this entire team come out of warp drive, right? Coming down the field, and then, boom, they all sprint together, and they, and they all stay above the football. I mean, you can even notice the transition by this side. Watch them. Boom, they all try to stay above the ball. This guy's not, right? But all the rest of these guys right here, the majority of this team is above the football. This guy is too, these, this guy's not, and this guy's not. So you have to understand that point. That's what you're looking for, all right? And again, it was extra. Everything else in front of that is extra, all right? Does anybody have any questions about kickoff coverage? Um, what are the three levels of the kickoff coverage team? You mentioned gunner, contain, and. All right, so the three levels of kickoff coverage, right? You're talking about, you know, my three levels, like three levels of defense. So I got gunners, right? And then I got my second level fit players, and I have my safeties. Gunners, so my gunners are my twos as well. My twos are, are gunners. They're just outside gunners. They're contained. They're what I call force contained. And then you have your second level fit players, right? So, and then, and then you have your, your, your safeties, okay? So one of your safeties is a second level fit player to the kick side. The other one is the third level along with the kicker away from the ball side, if that makes sense. So uh, you, you have your three different levels there. Thoughts on two man shield versus three man shield on punt? What about two man shield and three man shield? What are your thoughts on them? Bert, uh, like one versus the I, other. I transitioned to, I, I, for a long time, I used three-man shield when I was at Auburn. And uh, what I try to do is stay on the cutting edge uh, of things. I like to be part of the early majority. Uh, I was part of the early majority. I remember coming into Auburn and, and, and implementing a, a, a shield punt, and they were like, what the heck is this? And this was this was 10 years ago. <laughs> and they're like, you know, they, they don't do that in the SEC. Can't believe, you know. You know, they're doing Alabama, you know, you get those, that's what they were saying. And so I'm like, this is going to work. This is going to really, really help us out. And so I, I love the three-man shield for a long time. And I stole him from my guys at, at Utah when I was there, which happened to be Urban Meyer uh, and his staff. And, uh, and uh, anyway, so uh, after a while, I got to the point where I started saying, you know what, the two-man shield allows me to have another gunner on the field. So why wouldn't I do that? You know, why wouldn't I implement another gunner? You know what I mean? And still feel good about protection. I, I got an O-line heart at, 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 in, in, my, in, in my background. So I, I always think about protection first and foremost. Uh, but, I, but I also think that, you know, adding a, adding a two-man shield brings in another gunner that, that can get down the football field. Uh, especially when teams just all they want to do is hold you up and you're not going to fake it. Like I, you know, last guy I worked for or the, or the first guy I worked for, um, you know, they weren't big on fakes, you know, Hey, we're not running a fake. Let's, let's just get the ball back, you know, or, you know, whatever. Um, so some guys aren't into, into that. And so if you're not running fakes and teams just sit there and hold up on you, hold everybody up, no, you're not running fakes, man, that, that can get hard. So I, I thought, I thought that, in the two-man shield was, was a benefit. And I also thought another benefit was in the two-man shield schemes that, that I've seen, um, they don't bring the other gunner into the protection ever. 
there's some three-man shield schemes that bring the backside gunner into protection, and I didn't like that either. So now you go from having, in traditional punt, from having two gunners in traditional punt now, right, and to having one gunner in, 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 a, in a shield punt scheme, you know, if you, if you got into a certain protection. So I didn't like that either. So I, I think the two-man shield philosophically uh, fits more than what, what I'm looking for at this level. Good what are some, oh, sorry. What are some indicators to look for when scouting opponents kick off a turn? Uh, you're just trying to identify their blocking schemes. You know, what are they doing? Um, I, I, I go a step further, you know, what and why are they calling it? You know what I mean? Is it, are they calling it because it kicks in the boundary? Are they calling it because it kicks in the middle of the field? Or, you know, why are they calling it? If you have the ability to kick in multiple field zone locations, then then you can play around with that and be ahead ahead of whoever's calling their kickoff return game, and know exactly where they're kicking it. So, um, so that's that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for what they're actually running and why they're running it. What is your opinion on going butt side? Uh, is that cross face? I'm assuming is what you're talking about when you say butt side. Um, uh, I don't teach butt side. I teach ball side. Um, I can really care less about what the kickoff team, kickoff return team is doing. Uh, I want them to go to the ball. I think that's very important. Uh, they should beat their man to the ball side. And if they're on the front side of the ball, then, then they should be two gapping and driving if in doubt. If you, if you don't know which way to go, when in doubt, you should two gap and drive. That's, it goes across the board. That's why I spend so much time on the sled drill and the two gap and drive drill teaching them how to do that because um, you can catch a guy in transition and effectively two-gap and drive him, or you can stem in a guy and he thinks you're going to two-gap and drive him, and all of a sudden you can burst by him. And, and, and so there, there's a number of things that you do, but I don't teach, you know, go butt side. You know, if somebody, for example, on a field return, if I kick the ball middle to left uh, and, and I know it's a field return, I mean, I'm not going to ask my guys on the right side to go butt side and open up a big hole in the middle. Right? That doesn't make any sense to me. I'm going to ask them to go to the ball, but be, be ready to get vertical. Be ready to get vertical. Don't get washed. Go to the ball, but get vertical because that, that return is coming back to you if, if you feel that re, uh, kickoff return team washing you inside. So we're pushing vertical, and I got some great examples uh, on my drill tapes of that uh, very thing. Uh, if any of you guys, man, if I know some of you guys and y'all want to chat it up with your staff or whatever, um, guys, I'm at home every day. <laughs> I'm at home every day, man. So, you know, uh, some of you guys, I know some of your head coaches from being on the road recruiting and whatnot, man, just reach out to us and, and, um, and we can get it in. I've already done that with several high school staffs. Uh, that's what your opponents are doing, just so you know, in case you, if you're not doing that, your opponents are doing that. And, uh, we, we're, we're probably more busy now than we've ever been, uh, but we're doing what we love to do. I'm sitting here talking ball and, and I'm having a great time, man and families downstairs cooking and doing their thing and going to school and I'm talking ball all day, man. So it's a, it's a treat. Any, anything else, Miss Tori? There's a couple more. Um, let's just get a couple more and then we'll shut it down. Yeah. Um, no. so, so by being above the ball, are you forcing an inside out versus an outside in approach? Where do you want the ball to go? Uh, by being above the ball, you're forcing the returner to spill. You're forcing him to run sideways. And while he's running sideways, your guys are taking shots. I tell her, and it was funny in this past season, man, I, you know, you know, how you know, you try to, and I'm, I can't sit there and claim that I'm, you know, can relate to all the guys that, you know, cause I'm getting older by the day, by the second. Um, but, but I told, told a group of guys, man, I said, Hey man, you know, you know, the, the way we teach our scheme, man, these guys are going to run sideways now. All right. Don't be afraid to shoot your shot. Right. And so I put a, put a, a graphic up on the, on the screen, man. I said, shoot your shot. And then you know what shoot your shot mean. Now, when you walk by and see a pretty girl, you know what I mean? If, if you're either going to shoot your shot or you're not, you know? So I put that on the screen and it was a graphic of a guy trying to talk to a girl. Oh man, they, they were saying it all year long, man. Coach, I shot my shot, coach. I ain't afraid to shoot my shot. You know what I mean? So they just related to it. And that's just something that you do to get them to understand, man. Hey, I'm telling you to go be aggressive here. Go be aggressive. You know, you can say that all you want. What does that mean? Hey, go shoot your shot. Oh, okay. I get that, coach. Yeah. Let me shoot my shot. <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, it was just, it's just that, that's, that's what we're forcing our, our, those kids to do when, when we're staying above the ball. 
And we got contained players to force them back in. So it doesn't matter. They can go sideways if they want to. They're going to eventually run into one of those twos that I'm telling them to be forced contained players. Or on the punt team, one of those guys is turning them back inside to everybody else. Which, what else? Thoughts on straight shield versus rugby punt? Thoughts on straight shield? Is that what you said? Yep. Straight shield versus rugby punt. I think, I think people should use rugby punt if your punter is not very good. I think that's an excellent, excellent weapon. Now, if you can't do that either, you need to find another guy. <laughs> if, you can't rugby, if you can't rugby one, two, three, and let it go, and and or 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 punish, punt it, you know, then you need to find another punter. <laughs> Be honest with you. I mean, we're at a little bit different deal here because we get to recruit our guys, right? Uh, we get to sign the guys that we want that can do what we ask them to do. Um, but uh, I think rugby punt is a nice change up. Um, you know, to what what you're doing, uh, you can steal some field position if you get if your guy's pretty good at it and get it rolling. You can get those long, long punts. Uh, but I also think it's good if your if your punter is not any good, if he's not good enough getting the ball up in the air uh, with the appropriate hang time and distance. Uh, I think rugby is a nice option and a nice change up to have in, in, in another tool in your tool belt as you're calling the you know the, the game. Uh, to, to have teams prepare for that. Because that takes a lot of uh, prep for the punt return team to prepare for that. Uh, one, to field it. Uh, and then two, uh, don't get hit by it. <laughs> because, you know, some guys hold on to it longer and this, that, and the other. So I think, I think, I think both of those have a place. Uh, and again, it depends on your ability level or your punter. Any rules for your punt returners? When, when not to, or fair catch? Uh, well, in terms of fair catch, that that's strictly his decision, right? Uh, I, I do try to teach him to be smart in that area. Um, you know, scouting each week. I mean, what, what kind of punter is he? You know, is it a guy that's hanging it up there? Well, sometimes punt returners don't know, and they don't have any idea. So I'm, I'm watching this guy, and I'm, and I, and I'm timing him every week, right? I, I, I'm going to ask, ask um, my, my, uh, my, my assistant, my quality control assistant, uh, to to make sure he puts all the times and distances on 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 the uh, on the on the deal on the exos so that I know exactly what each punt is. So at the end of that that day of scouting those guys, I know exactly what they're doing and what kind of punter that we're facing. So I can set, tell the punter, hey, look, he's gonna. I'm telling the punt returner, hey, look, he's gonna give you some chances, man. Those balls are low, you know, on average, you know, yada yada yada, whatever that language is. Or flip side of that is, hey, man, he's putting the ball up there. Uh, with really good hang time and distance, all right? Uh, the best move here, unless you feel a low one, is probably the fair catch. I mean, so I'm telling them, you know, those things, and hopefully through training they can see it as well too. Uh, but but you know, the last thing you want, because it can be a turnover, the last thing you want is a guy that's out there that's just, you know, taking everything. And that's what the great ones do. They just take it everything, and you just, you just let them be because they're great at it. But uh, – but but you but you have to be you have to you know if you have problems filling the ball you want to make sure that you're coaching those returners up to be uh, selective and 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 the, and the grapes are very selective uh, they understand the difference in the two so good questions um, do you directional kick from hashes or middle of the field on punt on punt we're a directional punt team scheme punt scheme um, and so we're you know, obviously you can directional kick in anywhere, whether it's boundary side or, or hash. Um, kickoff, same thing. Uh, but I'm always in, in kickoff. And here's the thing. I mean, some guys do it and some guys don't. Uh, kickoff coverage, um, you know, some guys like to get on, a, get on a left hash and say, put the ball outside the numbers, right? I mean, that's what a lot of guys do. And then they – you know, some guys use that scheme where guys are chasing around everywhere and this, that, and the other. I think all those schemes are good to a certain extent. You know what I mean? I, I think I think they're hard at times uh, to, to, to get guys into understanding, you know, just how to cover. Like, you look in the NFL, you're not seeing that in the NFL. Think about that for a second. You know what I mean? You're not seeing those type of coverage schemes because the, the game is in the middle. Now, what you are seeing is in, in every just about every NFL coach I've ever talked to, I'm talking kickoff coverage now. Um, you know, you can place the ball in the middle and kick it directionally either way and then contain that guy on whatever part of the field that you place the football. And what it ends up doing is it 
forces that kickoff return team. If they don't know which way you're going, it forces them into their wedge returns. That's all they're going to run, a middle wedge, which, you know, as we well know, it's not the same as wedge as used to be, but, but it's forcing them into one or two returns. Because if not, they're going to end up having some bad calls for their sideline or boundary returns in, in, in half of the game, and you're going to end up stuffing them back inside the 20-yard line over and over and over again. And their head coach is going to be looking at them like, what are you doing? What are we doing? So, um, you know, so they typically go with their safe returns or some people just gamble and call a fair catch if you kick it a certain way. And then if they, you know that as a, as a kickoff coach, you can just keep kicking it that way and force a fair catch, you know. So um, I like directional kicking. I think directional kicking is very good on both coverage units. And I, and I strongly suggest if you're able to do that, uh, because that's what, that's what those teams that put the ball in the hash are doing. So I'm, I'm just doing it from the middle on kickoff and from everywhere on punt. That's it, Coach Bulwer. I think we're done. That's it. Today. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so is, that's it, it? That's it, it. Or do you want to keep going? You go. If you oh, want to keep, keep going. going. Yeah, it's All up right. to you. All right. Let's keep going for a little bit. Let's get go. to the next thing. Yes, All right. Kickoff return. Okay. The first drill that I do on kickoff return is leverage drill. Okay. I believe you have to teach your guys how to block with leverage. Every single one of them. Everybody on the team. Right. And, and what does that mean? You know, how do I, how do I, again, you know, what kind of, what kind of body position am I in? What kind of stance am I in when I'm making that contact? You know, and then once I make that contact, what is, you know, how do I sustain, sustain that contact? And so what, in this drill, I, I, I teach that. I teach it to our frontline guys, guys, you know, guys, and sometimes I even put our back end guys in there too as well, because I think they have to block with leverage too. But while, while the front guys are doing the leverage drill, the back end guys are working on their wedge setup, right? And of course, there's rules to this and this, that, and the other, which I'm not going to get into what we tell our guys. I think that's still, I think some guys are still trying to sort through that and as to what they're telling their guys. And I'm not going to give anybody any, any leeway, especially if they're not spending time studying it like I have. Uh, but, but whatever you're telling your back end guys, that's what you're doing, okay? That's what you're doing there. So uh, they're, they're setting that up and then here you go, okay? So you got two different drills going on at the same time. And so what I'm looking for there is I'm looking for what I call a flip turn, which is what you just saw every single one of these kids do, okay? All right, except for this kid. And, and so the tackles, if like if we were running a right return, if I had a tackle, he can, he can do the whirl, which is what this kid just did because he's usually gonna get a speed guy coming off the back end, right? He just stays in his outside hip, right? Or his inside hip, he can force this dude around. So that's kind of what I'm looking for from that position. But, but here, here we're talking a, a, a flip turn, right? So return side foot up, away from return side foot back. And then I'm asking these guys initially, you know, to put their hands behind their back, okay? All right, I don't like this position. I like, I like this one, all right? I like this one. I like his, uh, his position. He's okay, but I just think that needs that, that weight's a little bit outside the framework of his body. So what I'm looking for here, so everybody's on the same page, is I'm looking for a good stance, a good body position. A good body position to me is ankles inside shoes and knees inside ankles. Let me say that again. Ankles inside shoes and knees inside ankles, okay? I want my right foot up, my left foot back, all right? I want to be as square as I possibly can until the last minute, and I'm going to eventually engage. And here, we're working on just moving your feet and trying to keep your eyes on the, on the return side number. And so that's the first thing guys got to do. How many guys you've seen, how many times have you seen a guy try to block somebody and he just stops his feet? It makes no sense, all right? You got to move your feet, just like pass protection, right? You got to move your feet, right? You got to stay in front of the dude. So, so that's the first thing we're working with these guys. So after they do that, then I bring them back the same day, right? And now we're going to work the same drill, all right? And then we're going to put our hands on the guy now, right? So, so now we're putting hands on him, all right? So, so we're doing the same exact drill, all right? Now we put hands on him. Now we're punching, we're stepping into our punch, trying to, again, trying to maintain that leverage with our eyes on the return side number. And if we lose it, and eventually at some point, man, when that guy gets – out in front of me a little bit here, right? I gotta, I gotta finish this block. 
And the way I teach a finish, and you'll see right here, and I think you'll see a couple more over here, is a rip finish, right? So I'm about to lose them, I'm about to lose them, about to lose them. No, I'm not gonna lose you. I'm gonna rip finish. I'm gonna rip finish. One last ditch effort to sustain leverage, return side leverage on this guy, all right? So that's what we're doing. And it's a fine line. Like, if this is the point of attack, I don't want you rip finish it here. I'd prefer you just drive them out of bounds, right? But you're just teaching that concept right now as opposed to, uh, as opposed to just, you know, hey, you know, holding or anything else. Or I lost a dude or whatever. And so, again, like I said, while that's going on, you know, whatever you're teaching your back end guys, that's what you're doing there with those guys. Those guys are working on just the setup, the distance, 12 by 3 or whatever it is. You know, uh, whatever you're telling your wedge setup guy to do, all right, even though they can't come together like this, is, this film is a little bit dated. Uh, they can't come together like this, but, but whatever, you're, you know, they can stop right there, right? As long as they're on different levels, and here we go. So wherever your setup point is, that's what you're looking for and, and for your returner, off returner, and your back end guys, okay? Uh, the double team, I use a technique, and, and we're not going to be faced like this, but, but there's going to be a guy sitting on top and there's gonna be a guy turned sideways. The guy on top is called the post player. The guy facing sideways is called the pin player. But once that's just the position. That's the position, post and pin, right? Uh, the technique that they're using is a technique I call the banger and the builder. Again, I'm giving you meat and potatoes right now. Banger and builder, right? So what is that, coach? Well, it's real simple. This guy's gonna go one way or the other. And, and on kickoff team, you really don't know which way it's gonna be. It depends on the direction of the ball, what he's being taught to do, so forth and so on. The majority of guys are taught to go to the outside guy and get vertical. Well, the outside guy's gonna be turned. So if he's coming right to you, that should be pretty simple. But whichever side he decides to go, the guy away from him has, try, has got to try to get in two shuffles. Two shuffles will ensure that you're not getting a counter move back immediately. So you, you see, you know, and, and I'm trying to get it. And I'm not saying we're going to get it every single time because this thing happens a lot faster, but, but you want to try to get two shuffles in. Like you got zero and this, this kid just turns and runs right now. Right. But this guy right here is the banger. All right. So if he comes your way and he attacks you, you bang the crap out of him, man. You try to beat the crap out of him. And then once that hip disappears, he's coming over top to be the new banger, okay? And now he becomes the builder, the guy that's gonna get a couple shuffles in, right? And you notice he never went over the top. So part of the drill, he got it down. The other part, he's not quite in, in tune to it, okay? All right? And then after we do that, after we teach him how to double team, and I teach all these guys across the board how to double team, because we can double team anywhere on the front line, right? You can double team with these two guys. You can double team with these two guys. You can double team with these two guys. You can double team with those two guys. So everybody's got to understand the banger and builder technique on the front line. And so once we do all that, we get back into uh, uh, an indie drill. And I put back dots and whatnot. I got this from a guy at the Saints when he was at the Saints. He's at LSU now. But um, uh, my point being is we're just teaching them how to pick up the guys in the scheme, right? return side leverage, and so forth and so on. Now, what, what, I, what, what I get, and I don't know if you guys are getting a bunch of this, I'll start getting all kind of twists. I'll get, I'll get guys chipping and twisting and guys doing that and this. And, you know, I mean, I, I'll get all types of crap. So we teach them basically to learn how to zone this stuff off in this drill, right? Or stay on it, man, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. I mean, so you get a number of different setups there that you can teach your guys in a, in a close, close proc setting, okay? So, again, you're just teaching that they're not having to run very far, right? And, and you can get a lot of reps at the finished portion of your return, okay, whatever your return is. And then while you're, while you're doing that as well, all right, so you're on to whatever day that is that you get into that, right, which is, should be day two or day three. Um, now your guys, your back end guys go from wedge assign, a wedge setup to now assignment. Now they're actually blocking guys. You know, they're actually picking up the guys that they'll be picking up in the return game. So now they're actually picking up their assigned guys, okay? So now you've effectively worked that phase. You know, they're not working to get together now. You're already putting them together, and then you're just tossing the ball up and then letting them fit up, okay? Because, again, these are big guys, you know, 
Um, you, if you use big guys on the back end, like I've always had, I, I had a guy play this position and end up being the first round draft pick. Now he didn't play it his last year that he's the first round draft pick, but before that he did. And he was great at it. When he wasn't in there, we, we felt the difference. And he was my guy that set up the wedge, right? So, and then the last phase that we teach on, on kickoff return is just like we do on kickoff coverage. We teach close proximity. We teach it on kickoff coverage. And the first time I did this drill, I'll never, I'll never forget working with uh, Coach Whittingham in Utah. And I showed him an example of that drill that we did at Stanford. And I said, man, this is a physical drill. He looked at me and said, well, there's going to be about two or three guys that ends up getting knocked out of practice today. We're going to really get after it. I'm like, holy crap, what did I just say? You know, <laughs> and that's just the mentality. I mean, the toughness mentality that that team had. And, and sure enough, man, I mean, it was a physical son of a gun. Well, I don't do that anymore. I'm not trying to knock guys out of the, out of the, out of the deal or nothing like that. But you're teaching your guys how to fit up the return and then how to read the return, how to go to the point of attack. Like, this is really crappy by this kid. That's the point of attack right there. That's where he should run. Um, he started feeling himself a little bit. And uh, the next year, he wasn't nearly as good. Or good because of uh, he wasn't a technician. He wasn't, he wasn't understanding 100% what we're looking for there. You got to read it however you teach that, okay? All right. Any questions on kickoff return? Uh, I'm not sure if anybody even wants to talk punt return, but uh, do we have any questions on kickoff return? Um, nothing right now unless something comes in. You guys good? Had enough? Bored? Keep going. You, I, I, got a question. How do you determine the point of attack? Uh, for me, I'm a double team guy, right? That's my point of attack. It's like power, you know, for me. You know, whatever schemes we're running, we're like power. We're going to read it like power, like gap schemes too, inside, back out. And, and, and there's sometimes, you know, I tell, you know, I used to coach tailbacks in my previous spot. Uh, I used to tell, hey, Read it inside out. Read it A, B to C. Don't sleep on the backside A. Sometimes that backside A gap, because they overplay and they know where you're going, that backside gap is open too. So, yeah, we the point of attack for me is at the double team. That's a great question. Um, how many return schemes do you think is necessary for a high school? That's a really good question. 75. Uh, <laughs> here, here's, here's my thought. I think you got to get good at something before you before you do other stuff. I, I think I really do, especially right now, right? I mean, think about that. I mean, how many how many of you guys are going through spring ball? You can raise your hand. I know there won't be any hands raised, right? You, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, I, I think you, you you have to get good at something first before you ever start putting on putting in anything else. But ideally, you'd like to have. You'd like to have, um, you know, maybe a sideline or, or you know, uh, mid drip, mid return. You know, when I say mid, I'm talking, you know, halfway between the, the sideline and 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 the hash, right? That's a point of attack. And then there's a sideline, bottom of the numbers, right, somewhere out there. And then there's there's a middle return. So if 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 you have some kind of middle return in some kind of sideline or mid return, now you have enough to combat against balls going in different places throughout the course of the year. You know, and if you put in, um, uh, you know, put that in both ways, now you can, you, can, you can do everything. But how good are you gonna be if you don't have a bunch of, you know, time to get that stuff ready to go? Who knows, you know, it depends on how, what kind of team you have. I mean, are they veterans? Or, are they all running the same thing they ran last year? You know, that type of thing. So I think you just got to be careful because if you're not good at anything, man, then, then, then it's, it's no good. I mean, it takes time to teach guys how to do the banger and builder technique. It takes time to get guys to zone off the backside, um, you know, twist and whatnot that you get. It takes time to teach guys how to work against a chip, you know, somebody trying to chip and knock your double team away. It takes time to do all those things. It takes time to get your wedge guys to set up and your returners to set up and MDM away to lead safety and your returner to set it and hit it. I mean, all that stuff takes time. And then, and then along with all of that, then you have all the specialty crap that you can get, surprise on side kicks, different formations, you know, so the list is endless. 
So you do the math in, in terms of how many returns you should put in, but make sure your team is ready for all that other crap too. <laughs> you know, you got to be ready for all that other crap because if you're not ready for all that, you're, it can get you beat. Do you prefer a 542 or 533 formation or something totally different? I, th I think it depends on your personnel, formationally, what you get into. Uh, if you don't have that many tight end, you know, DN type bodies that you put on the back end, um, you know, then then you might want to think about having more smaller guys. You know what I mean? You 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 utilizing the you know the the six man front as opposed to the five man front and four guys in the back end. You know what I mean? So you just take one guy away so that you can be too deep in the back end and and too deep up front. So it, it's personnel driven for for me. Perfect. Um, how do you handle the kickoff alignment concept that compresses the kickoff team to two thirds of the field? I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. Whoever asked that question, um, ask it again. Just I'm not sure what you mean by the the compressing part of it. I'm I'm, I'm a little bit. Are you talking about the, the waterfall starts? Uh, you know when they start off you know, really wide and they, they jog down a line and the waterfall starts. I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Maybe you can type that in again. Um, okay. Um, how do you approach a team that is good with both field and boundary with returns? Ooh. Um, well, if a team is, is a good return team, right, um, then it, it goes back to, you know, what are you, are you good? What are you good at? That's the first thing I'm going to ask. If you're not good, at covering kicks and you're facing somebody that 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 is a really good field and boundary return team um you know the first thing that comes to my mind is get the ball out of their out of their returners hands <laughs> that's the first thing uh let alone you know what they're actually running it's, it's probably more so who's running it than necessarily what they're running uh but if you can't do that um then 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 it's it's, it's a matter of um you know who you're kicking to man i mean I just think that you can try to, you know, get somebody in, you know, that that's a field and boundary return team. Well, if they're a boundary return team, are they a boundary return both ways? You know, do they do they do it to the right and to the left? Or are they just one boundary return and then one field return from the same spot? Which, if I was in high school, most kickers kick to my right. All right, if you're the kickoff team, they kick to your left. You know, most right-footed kickers kick that way. That that'd be where I start. I'd have a boundary return over there. And then I have a field return off of it. Well, what if somebody puts the ball on the right hash and kicks it right? That would be my first thought. You know, have they seen that? You know, because your kicker can probably do it. You know, I don't see very many people do it. I've seen it happen in our in our league last year, probably for the first time in seven years. A team just said, you know what? I'm, I've been left, left all year, and now I'm going to be right this game because I know they're a right return team. And that team didn't know what to do. They had no idea you know, what, what return to call. They, they couldn't call their field return because their field return was now a boundary return. And their boundary return was now, a field re, was now a field return. I mean, so it just screwed them up. So rather than flip their personnel, which they hadn't worked in the middle of a game, all right, they just took an L the whole game on the kickoff return scene. <laughs> so, I mean, fair catch signal at this level, that's what, you, that's what you go to and just take it on 25. How do you personnel players and keep them excited about special teams? Do you have any awards or recognitions or anything? Yeah, those are good questions, man. We, uh, we, we have awards um, everywhere I've ever been, um, probably minus my first year uh, doing it. Uh, there's some kind of award system. I give out – I'm the candy man, okay? I give out Snickers, the big Snickers, the big Crunch Bars, uh, the big Starburst for out-of-this-world plays. I mean, I mean I, I'm doing that. I mean, I – I, and I and I spend I spend my money doing that, you know. I mean, it's probably some kind of NCAA rule, I'm sure. But but um, you know, a big play and a big play is a Snickers bar, the big Snickers. And I'm not talking about the little. I'm talking about the, you know, that big old giant sucker. You know what I mean? I'm talking diabetes in a wrapper. You know, uh, a crunch, a big hit, a big hit's a crunch bar, a big crunch bar. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm tossing that thing around. You better duck because <laughs> it's a big one. You know what I mean? I'm tossing it in the, in, the, in, the, in the special teams meeting on on our first day back after a game uh, and then just an out of this world plays that you know, big Starbucks, which you don't give out a whole bunch of those. And then, and then, and then uh, for me in the past is I've given out hammers uh, for physicality. Uh, I got a big old sledgehammer that I had that I left at my last place, obviously. Um, 
um, uh, I, I've, I went to Italy one year and I got a big, uh, I'm, I'm a big Maximus, you know, that whole Aurelius. I mean, I had the helmet, I had the sword, I had a dagger. I mean, I had it all. I mean, I brought it all back and almost got stopped at customs because they saw a big old sword, sword in my bag. I mean, I had, I had all that stuff, man. And I, and that was, that was the stuff for one year as well too. So I just, I just keep it fun and keep it, keep it going, man. Just, you know, think of something in the summer, you know, when I take a few couple of weeks off and try to get my mind, mind right on the next season and, and, you know, kind of everybody recharges their battery every year, man. When I do that, that's when I come up with the ideas of, Hey, this is what we're doing next year now. So, I mean, it kind of changes for me. Those and are what we've done, I'm going to jump in there too, Coach Boulware, just because with that in team meeting, so that Sunday after we play, come back, they're recognized in front of the whole team. We would do shirts, mm. and then we would also have the hit city. Clearly, we'll mm -hmm. determine if that continues. And then whoever was the special teams player of the game, um, we had offense, defense, and special teams. Their graphic above the locker changes for that week, mm. acknowledging that, and then they also get to run out with one of the flags. Boom. So, there you go. You see what I'm saying? It's already in place. It's already in place. So, we'll, we'll you know, I, I just think you need to keep keep it fresh and keep things going and keep doing things like that, uh, make it important. Uh, that's something I didn't really cover, you know, some, again, something I got from one of the guys I talked to. It's not offense. It's not defense. It's defense. And it's, 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 it's a part of the game, man, where your guys on offense and defense get to play together, uh, not, not independently, but together. And it, it can pay huge dividends to making your football team better. That's why I call it we fence. And so, you know, you got three sides of the ball. I think our guys, um, you know, as I continue to get around them, they're going to understand the importance of that to me and uh, understand it's how I feed my family. This is how they can eat. And they're going to understand that we eat together. We all eat on the same level. I heard a, a pastor talk about, um, I think it was T.D. Jakes talk about, you know, a giraffe and a grasshopper can be standing in the same spot and not eating on the same level, right? Because the giraffe, he's eating way up here somewhere and that grasshopper is eating down there by, by the giraffe's uh, feet. Well, they're not eating on the same level. You know, they're two totally different, different, different animals and, uh, and insects, creatures, whatever you want to call them. But, but that's not us. You know, we're eating on the same level. You know, we're, we're in the same space, eating the same food. My success is their success, right? And they need to understand that. And once they understand that, they know that, hey, you know what? He ain't doing nothing but trying to win. <laughs> he just wants to, hey, then they play for you, man. They understand it. They get it. They see that you're human, that you, that you make mistakes and all that stuff. I believe that's important, too, to admit when you're wrong at times. Uh, if, if you say something and, and, it, and you don't act like you have all the answers, just keep it real with these kids because these kids know a lot more. They're way more woke than we were when we were playing. You know what I mean? They see a lot more stuff than, than, than we ever did, you know. So I just think you got to keep it, keep it 100, as they say, with them. You know what I mean? If you do that, then, then they'll respect you. We're good on the questions. Yes, sir. We're out of questions? All right, like I said before, I don't want to take up everybody's time. We can get in the punt return independently if you guys want to. Um, at some point in time, like I said, you guys can always reach out to me. Um, it's 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 an honor. It's a privilege. Miss Tori, did I use up all my time? Oh, all yeah, right. you went over. You're good. Okay, yeah, that's what I said. I, I, figured, I figured I was over. But, um, guys, what, like I said before, yeah, this, say it again, Coach. What's your email address? Give them your email address. Maybe they can – there you I go. Can put it, I'll put it in the email that I send out afterwards to everybody. You guys got that? Okay, Boom. Miss Tori has it. Like I said, guys, it's an honor. It's a privilege to be here in front of you guys. I love, I love this university. I love being back in this state um, with, with the high school coaches in this state. Uh, this is a truly a blessing to me and uh, my family, man. And I thank you guys for taking the time out and listening to me for an hour or whatever it's been, man. So if y'all have any questions, please don't hesitate to shoot them, shoot them my way, man. And uh, good luck to everyone. Uh, keep, keep your family safe, faith, family, football. Football's a distant third. Those first two are the most important things in my life. I pray that you guys are the same way. Hook them. Hook them. Bye, guys.